So um, thank you very much for this invitation. I've been looking forward to it as well and was really disappointed when I had my Zoom malfunction because I'm pretty sure it was mostly me back in October and uh, just really glad that we could work this out for this time around and um, talking about a topic that I just dearly love involving plants and, and Florida wetland archaeology. It's like the gift that keeps on giving in so many respects. So let me just, um, just share my screen. And okay, so I think that looks like that's up and running. So, so Macedon's gourds and the first Floridians and um, a lot of linkages with the deep past and, and ancient flora and fauna and moving forward in time. And um, I hope this is all clear. Um, I think it's super interesting and I'll be interested to hear what you all think when we're finished. So um, I'm gonna be focusing on these particular sites spanning Paleo-Indian and really before the first peopling with the Latvis Simpson site at the top and Paige Ladson. So both in the Oscilla River in Jefferson County and then also Little Salt Spring in Sarasota County, Paleo-Indian through something around Middle Archaic, Windover, Early Archaic, one of our wetland cemeteries or pond cemeteries, Salt Springs in Marion County, early through late archaic and Hontoon Island in Volusia County. So really kind of all around the greater Orlando Winter Springs area and spanning the late archaic through um, St. John's one and St. John's two periods. So that's kind of the cultural framework. And then all of this is going to be involving plants in the pumpkin gourd squash family, Cucurbitaceae and uh, in particular two genera and species. So the bottle gourd, Lagenaria cicereria, I hit admit, <laughs> and cucurbita pipo, pumpkin squashes and gourds. But in particular, we're focused on the wild gourds, at least to begin with in, in this particular group. And then the overall context, the environmental context, at least where this story begins, is in the late Pleistocene. And as I'm sure everyone is aware, um, so much of the global water budget was tied up in glacial ice. Sea levels were much lower than what we know today. So we had a much broader Florida, the Florida platform, much of, his, much of it being exposed at this point in time. And um, if you look at the landscape itself, then it wasn't until around 9,000 years ago that sea levels even started to approach the modern shoreline. This, um, this ancient landscape, as far as Florida is concerned, wasn't necessarily much cooler, if at all, in the Pleistocene, the late quote ice age, but it was definitely drier and freshwater sources were really limited across the peninsula and appear to have been largely um, connected with uh, springs that would penetrate you know, to the Florida aquifer. So bubbling up of spring water, uh, much of the rivers that we know today were not flowing river systems. So much drier, somewhat cooler perhaps, and freshwater limited, thinking about you know, extant flora and fauna of the time, not to mention some of the first peoples. The um, landscape based on pollen analytical data shows that, that Florida at this time was very much analogous to an African savanna setting, an open grassland with some pine, maybe just scattered pine and fluctuations in pine woodland. And then otherwise, deciduous trees and, and other types of vegetation, mostly tied to the freshwater and somewhat wetter areas. And then as these plots show, the vegetation proceeded to change over time. One thing we know from the pollen data for Florida through the late Wisconsin is that we had plants here, trees like um, spruce, which today is in Georgia, northern Georgia and further north. 
and American chestnut and some other taxa that we don't find in Florida today. And if you think about that in combination with the unique climatic conditions and things like um, ancient megafauna, the extinct Pleistocene fauna, and some of the other organisms like amphibians displaced from the north because of the cooler conditions up here, then we have a completely unique situation when we're talking about the late Pleistocene. We can't just precisely equate it with forests and ecosystems and conditions that we see today. It was truly a, a no, novel climate, no analog communities in terms of the combinations of plants and animals that were present. And certainly, you know, the um, environmental and, and resource circumstances that greeted the first Americans, the first Floridians is, is what I like to say. So it's an important point to understand. Okay, so um, with the first sites, we're beginning here in the Florida Panhandle, like I said, Jefferson County, and with emphasis on the Osceola, Wasissa, and Wakulla rivers, mainly these first two, and Page Ladson and the Lapis Simpson sites, which are located in the Osceola. This is the confluence of the Osceola and the Wasissa, and um, many of you may be aware of the um, extinct bison with a projectile point embedded in the frontal bone. So it was some of the first good evidence linking Paleo-Indian hunters with extinct Pleistocene fauna. The Page Ladson and Latvis Simpson sites are, are thick with evidence of Pleistocene plants and animals, and for example, this mastodon tusk. So one member of the ancient proboscidean clade, the ancient elephants that occurred in Florida and elsewhere at this time. So um, one thing to understand is that the Columbian mammoth and American mastodon were both here in the late Pleistocene, but these two elephant taxa um, exhibited some niche partitioning. They utilized the landscape differently, sort of shared the landscape differently, with the mastodon being primarily a, a grazer of grasses and other herbaceous vegetation, and the mastodon being adapted to browse on woody vegetation on, on forest growth. And this is evident, you know, in, in one respect from their dentition. So the mammoth's dentition, these like large striate molars were supremely adapted to grind up that, that grassy herbaceous vegetation. And in contrast, the mastodon molars have these very high uh, ridged crowns, deep ridges and valleys that were perfect for consuming the rough woody brows that form the bulk of their diet. All right, and it's the American mastodon that this story mainly involves as the original forest elephant browsing in Florida's forest, but as well as other forested ecosystems in Eastern North America. This plot from um, original fawn map, so faunal mapping of Pleistocene or, or rather paleontological and archeological records, is now incorporated in the Neotoma paleoecology database, which is excellent. But, but you can note that this is spanning the Wisconsin, the last glacial period in North America from early to middle to late. And we can see quite a bit, these uh, triangular maroon triangles, quite a bit of evidence for mastodon in the east because of the more forested, forested setting. And especially in and around the Great Lakes and, and you know Northern Illinois and Ohio and so on, these ancient spruce dominated wetlands. So this was sort of prime mastodon habitat back in the day. So quite a few of these finds of mastodon is in you know ancient peat bogs that are in you know directly reflect uh, spruce and related vegetation. So they were have been described as having a coniferous forest browsing niche and in those upper more northerly regions this especially involved 
browsing on Spruce. So I mentioned that Spruce was present present in Florida, at least in the late Pleistocene, but the pollen records don't suggest a real abundant presence of spruce. Instead, in Florida, Mastodon still congregating in the watered wetlands, wet forests, swamp forests, bottomland forests, as they were beginning to develop, relied on cypress, bald cypress and or pond cypress as sort of the spruce substitute is how I would describe it in these southern landscapes. And we know this because the um, Asilla River preserves really extensive mastodon dung deposits, like volumes and volumes of, of ancient mastodon dung. And it's just a rich record in and of itself of this ancient animal's browsing and health and nutrition. And, and as a keystone species, you know, inferred its effect on this ancient ecosystem and legacy effects. So this is what the digesta looks like. The quote, digesta is what David Webb, the original paleontologist on the project, termed the dung sample. So a Silver River digesta, this is from Paige Ladson. And you can see that it's quite woody, a lot of woody particles, but they're very uniform in, in length and, and diameters or widths throughout. That's, that's one hint. It's very similar to African forest dung, or excuse me, African elephant dung, with emphasis on African forest elephants in terms of this intense woody browse. And then um, looking closely at the individual fragments, many are lopped off, you know, kind of chopped off at the ends. And and the wood identification then shows that something like 98% of this browse is from the apical growth, the terminal growth of cypress trees, probably fringing the ancient sinkhole of Page Ladson and, and, and similarly down what is now the Osceola River system today. Do also, I hope you can't hear my dogs. I have two dogs, four dog beds, and they're gonna fuss over who gets the warmest dog bed. Hopefully that'll stop. So do also see the, um, the cones in terms of the individual cone scales in these dung samples. All right, um, I also considered the possibility that giant ground sloths accounted for some of the dung deposits and, and they may well have contributed. However, when it came to measuring, you know, and, and statistically analyzing the, the composition, the cypress fragments and so on, and against the hills and valleys of the molars, it was a, a super nice fit. And so that worked with mastodon. We also did um, conducted steroid analysis and that argued for large elephant-like mammal. All right, so, so the, the bulk of it, no pun intended, is apparently from mastodons. There's also abundant evidence in the form of mastodon uh, teeth, mastodon skeletal remains, and tusks found in the, throughout this river system and these deposits. All right, so in addition to the cypress browse, then um, mastodons also were consuming hazelnut, American beech, oak acorns, and hickory nuts. And by way of example, here are three of the hazelnuts um, from the dung deposits. They're just beautifully preserved. If, um, if you understand about preservation in these wetland settings, it's because they're so oxygen limited that the normal microbial contingent that would attack things like this is just entirely absent, you know, for the most part, if not entirely. And so you, you have this exceptional preservation. It's the lack of oxygen, not as much the uh, moisture. Here's some additional examples of uh, chest, uh, hazelnut specimens that appear to have been lopped off, you know, when passing past the dentition of the mastodon. All right, and then this mastodon trail mix also included things like wild plums and hawthorns and wild grape and blackberries and 
and uh, pokeweed, which you know would, is a good medicinal plant as well. And um, and I want to point out something further than about hazelnut with all of this in mind. So the, the range of hazelnut today, and I might have just alluded to this a moment ago, is north of the Florida Peninsula, fairly well north of the peninsula. And yet I have found this same taxon in a number of deposits. So both Paige Ladson and Latvis Simpson so in deposits predating a Paleo-Indian presence, also Cutler Ridge, so all the way down in Miami in the late Pleistocene and earlier in time and the Lysi shell deposits around Tampa. So this, this taxon had a, a larger range in the past that encompassed much of the Florida Peninsula. So then that begs the question, how does that happen? How do plants move? So people are, are often well aware of pollen and the dispersal of pollen and the pollen rain and how it affects your sinuses and, and you know, air quality and all of that. But another aspect and, and really the, the sort of meat of the issue for how plants move is in large part their association with animals. If they're not wind or water dispersed in terms of the plant propagules, the seeds and fruits, then this arena, um, mutualism with animal vectors of dispersal is the biggie. And you move animals around, we move the seeds around, the dung deposits, and we move the plants around. And so I imagine you see where I'm headed with this, thinking mastodons. So um, as far as this dispersal mutualism with vertebrates, vertebrate taxa, the plants display all kinds of adaptations to attract their vertebrate partners, like the sweet, brightly colored fruits that are typical of bird dispersed fruits. Mammal dispersed fruits as a primary vector tend to be not real bright, um, but high in oil content, um, often have a fleshy edible package here and seeds that are intended to pass like the bird fruits straight through the system. The seeds may be toxic or bitter or thick walled to sort of affect survival through the animal's tract. Other adaptations include what various, you know, gazillions of ways to hook onto animal fur or even feathers. So maybe you've seen, you know, stick tights and so on, on uh, dog fur and others. Here's two examples, cockle burr with various ways to hook onto animals and then ride along passively in terms of dispersal into some other area. Okay, and then related to all of that is the idea of anachronisms. Plants that were long adapted for dispersal like with ancient mega mammals, ancient proboscideans, um, but then with the animals becoming extinct post Pleistocene and so on, then the plants lose their dispersal agent. And so there's been some research into this topic in and of itself, but it definitely relates to this talk today um, regarding Florida and our pumpkin squash family, among others. So, um, so Osage Orange is, is one example. And I cite Carl, Connie Barlow's book, one of the first to really look closely at this. Avocado itself is one. Today, tapers will spit out the seed. They can't really just swallow it. They'll consume the fleshy part, but spit the seed out. But it's been suggested that giant ground sloths and probably gumpathier and other elephants were part of this dispersal. On the hooks and spines and things, this is modern in Africa and, and hooks onto such as giraffe legs. But several large plants like Devil's Claw appear to have had a, a deeper time association with um, camel and horse and so on in the Americas and lost their dispersal partners. The gourd squash family is uh, implicated as another example. So 
bitter wild gourds and dispersal by ancient Pleistocene animals. So is another anachronistic plant. So now we're wending our way towards the mastodons and indeed the mastodon dung from the Asilla River system is, is thick with gourd squash seeds, the cucurbita seeds and um, specifically Cucurbita pipo, subspecies ovifera, the group that includes the eastern wild gourd taxa. So I, I didn't go back and look at the total count, but there are, are hundreds of these and you can see they're beautifully preserved. If you're familiar with the seeds from maybe um, crook neck squash, very similar, and pumpkins, very similar, but dating to the Pleistocene. This is, um a radiocarbon dating table for dung samples from the Page Ladson site. And you see an AMS data cucurbita seed listed here at 12,570 years ago. We directly dated one seed from the uh, Latvis Simpson site and it, it came out around 31,000 years ago. So the gourds and the mastodon have a deep time history in the state of Florida. Just um, a couple of more things back to ancient anachronisms and megafauna, which also relate. The honey locust is thought to be one of these plants with, with sweet pods, sweet pulped pods that would have drawn such as a gompotheer or mastodon or maybe a ground sloth and um, prickly pear cactus. We have a lot of that in Florida. That is thought to be anachronistic too for ancient mega herbivores, browsers and such. In, in these cases, like examples today in Africa and, and elsewhere, the desert Southwest, it's thought that the spines, which are pretty intense for honey locust, or um, the plant's way of defending itself so the animal doesn't consume the whole plant, you know, going after the, the fruit. And, and then that would sort of defeat the purpose. <laughs> you know, you, you might get some dispersal, but the whole plant is dead. So it's thought to be a defense while displaying that bright red prickly pear fruit for this megafaunal partner to come and consume and disperse. I can tell you from analysis of volumes and volumes of mastodon dung that thorns didn't much discourage mastodons. So these are from Page Labs and samples with hawthorn thorns, something like um, blackberries or wild rose here, and the locust, probably water locust here related to honey locust. And you see that if you watch video of African elephants today to consuming on consuming wild acacias, which are very thorny. So maybe it works to some extent, but not entirely. And then too about the um, riding along on the animal's coat, um, also present in the mastodon dung samples are, are cockleburr, just FYI on that in passing. So um, all this in mind, one thing that, that I started doing years ago is, is looking at elephant, African elephant foraging behavior and, you know, related things. So um, they tend to feed, just summarizing from these authors and others, from a wide range of, of different plants, um, which is good. They avoid overuse of plant stands, completely stripping a forest. I'm not entirely sure I agree with that, but that's the general consensus. They do avoid excessive intake of plant compounds by being a little more Catholic about this. Um, plant compounds that may be noxious and the toxicity add up and reduce digestibility and so on. So that's a good reason to keep moving along and consuming things. And I note too from these studies, the bark of particular trees like the acacias and then think about our honey locust and water locusts and so on in Florida, which are close relatives of, of African acacia, provide some additional nutrients and fatty acids and things. All right, then looking specifically at elephant dung, they have a tendency to swallow fruits whole, 
And so the large well-protected seeds, like I described for faunal, for, for mammal dispersed seeds, tend to survive the molar mills, to quote one, and digestive tract. So they pass through in a viable state and they even land in a nice patch of fertilizer, if you think about it. There's some seasonal variation depending on the movement of the elephants and the seed frequencies in the dung may not per se be in complete agreement with the actual densities in the local vegetation. And that's because they are selective, you know, to some extent. They have food preferences, even though kind of browsing widely. And then you can look at dung piles in terms of African elephants. So one sample of 31 showed over 700 seeds that were representative of 11 plant taxa in nine families. Another one demonstrated 13 species. Another one, 123 piles, had an average of 291 seeds. And I was interested in this transit time that was recorded of 23 to 36 hours. This relates to what I'm, where I'm headed with the mastodons. But for the moment, in this particular sample, there were 28 species recorded, representing trees and shrubs and palms and herbaceous vines. But most frequent were a wild melon. So here's a, a wild bitter melon and a thorny tree legume, acacia. This is sort of more or less equivalent to our cucurbita melon in the mastodon dung. I tend to call it cucurbitic gourd. It's more gourd-like. And, um, and our, our, our locusts in our samples, maybe among others. All right, and so elephants, if you look at dung volumes and rates too, can leave a lot of dung around. You know, hence the volumes of dung, layers upon layers in the Asilla River, you know, setting quiet water, ancient sinkhole setting where they haven't been disturbed for, for millennia. All right, another thing, um, so, well, so one thing with what all I just noted was that it's clear that the bulk, as in literally and figuratively, of mastodon brows, and it was an ancient proboscidean, it was a high, hind gut, gut fermenter, so passing a lot of food through the system. The bulk of that was based on this cypress browse. But one thing that became evident early on was while I find the, the woody apical growth, twigs and such, and the cones, the cone fragments and scales as I noted, I see almost no leaves, none of the um, green tissue being preserved. And that was puzzling until I remembered that cypress is one of the few deciduous conifers. So it, it drops the leaves in the cooler months of the year. The cones tend to stay on board somewhat longer after the leaves have fallen. And, and so this combined evidence suggested that the mastodons were visiting Florida repeatedly in the time of year when you had lost the green tissue, when you lost the leaves. So the deciduous season. So in our winter months in Florida, for the most part. And then that was further analyzed by looking at the tusks and the growth rings in the tusks and analyzing the isotopic composition, which suggested, um, this is Fisher's work and colleagues, that these animals were migrating annually from Florida. Here's our Asilla River area and maybe way down here for all we know, and up into the Piedmont, you know, into Georgia on a seasonal basis. So think again about that map of the hazelnuts and their current distribution. And we can also think about mastodons then moving gourds around as well across the entire peninsula. So in this ancient dispersal mutualism, at least that's the story that I've begun to understand to account for some of these distributions. All right, and then 
Many are aware that Page Labs and ultimately was also the scene of Paleo-Indian activity um, with the original radiocarbon date suggesting around 12,000 years ago, but with recent work at the site um, suggesting even earlier. So I'm alluding to work by Jesse Halligan and, and colleagues um, based out of FSU. Um, which has, has pushed those dates back earlier with some good evidence of a human presence at least 14,000 years ago. And it, it has a lot of implications for the first peopling of the Americas. And so the general thinking is that these, these limited sources of fresh water certainly we're drawing mastodons and, and other game, other animals for millennia, but they will also have drawn the first Floridians and also represented a convenient ambush spot to, to necessarily take some of this game. Probably a bunch of things going on. So um, from Jesse's work, this is a mastodon tusk that was recently recovered from the Asilla River. And the interesting thing are the cut marks um, around the Avilis line that suggests that it was deliberately removed from the newly dispatched mastodon. Um, these cut marks, maybe for marrow and maybe for the manufacture of implements. These, so the ivory four shafts, which you all may well be aware of, very much like similar objects manufactured by Inuit peoples. So, so, so maybe a deep time for this. And uh, again, out of elephant ivory. So we've got a lot of good evidence that's been emerging, linking Paleo-Indians with these ancient animals, you know, at, at minimum being present at the same basic time, and by extension plants too, right? Um, but certainly hunting or otherwise making use of, of animal parts. These are um, some new radiocarbon dates published by Halligan and, and colleagues for um, one of the excavations at Page Labs and with some um, lithic items, li human lithic items in this general area among others, but with some pretty early dates attached to those. But the thing that I especially wanna highlight from their work is that they um, also, analyze the presence of fungal spores. This is a coprophagous fungus that um, is specific to mammal dung, large mammal dung, so sporomyella, sporomyella. And they, it's been used by many paleontologists and, and archeologists working in the Pleistocene and early Holocene to track the presence and disappearance of such as mammoths and mastodons, the large, mega mammals. And so this, this line represents the um, dung spores. And then a proxy in this case for especially mastodon. So we can note its presence, a little bit of a decline, but a peak again around 12,000 years ago, a really uh, marked peak around maybe 11, eight to 12 here, and then some decline, you know, presumably in their presence. There's quite a extended drop during the Younger Dryas. So that was the severe cool snap in the late Pleistocene, early Holocene that um, was almost a return to glacial conditions, but didn't last long. And then we see the spores picking up again. And then by inference, then our mastodons are still here. Over here, if you can't really see, it's Bolin and Greenbrier, and this is pre-Clovis indications of Paleo-Indian based on the stone tools. So we've got people and we have mastodons. And then further along on this core, so here's back to the Younger Dryas, here's Bolin levels. So here's our line again, and we have a little bit of a peak, you know, post Bolin period and a decline, and then it flatlines. So it, it appears clear and, and other evidence suggests is suggests the same radiocarbon dating bone, lack of bone and such. 
that the extinction event is somewhere in this area, or at any rate, no more mastodons present in and around um, the Asilla River to the extent this sample is representative. So that's really interesting from my standpoint in terms of this ancient dispersal mutualism, which like equivalent dispersal mutualisms between African elephants and wild gourds was probably fairly tight. So when Mastodon became extinct, our original forest elephant, what about the gourds? You know, were the gourds left hanging? I couldn't resist saying that, <laughs> seeing this image again. Um, you know, one might expect that they would have gone extinct. So um, in conjunction with a team of us, cucurbitologists, you might say, but especially Logan Kistler, who was one of my doctoral students when I was at Penn State. He's now just opened the Smithsonian's first ancient DNA lab, if anybody's got an interest in working with him or going there to study. Um, so we decided to address this question with the ancient DNA. And in fact, the evidence shows a bottleneck in terms of this taxon. Um, in that post-elephant period, but, but then it, it resumes. And we have inferred then that humans, basically Paleo-Indians and maybe early archaic people, filled that niche. They, they uh, took up the charge and became the, the promoters and dispersers of those ancient wild gourds in lieu of the ancient elephant presence. So this is from our paper. We hypothesized that Holocene ecological shifts, for sure, changes environmentally and some would have affected them. And megafaunal extinctions severely impacted wild cucurbita, while their emerging domestic counterparts adapted to the changing conditions of switching <laughs> via symbiosis with humans. And this would be really casual cultivators if anything, and about domestic counterparts, really that comes later. There's still a long period of wild gourds being present in and around Florida sites before we start seeing indications of domesticates. And I'm going to explain more about that now. So I've been kind of hinting that these gourds are quite bitter. They, um, they harbor the cucurbitacins, some noxious phytochemicals that are really a chemical defense against herbivory. And um, they're just too bitter. They're, they're supposed to be among the most bitter of plant compounds. Too bitter for humans and livestock. So her joking around with a rather large Sama melon from the Kalahari, she couldn't eat this. It, she'd be really sick or worse. The, Mice in the Kalahari wait for melons to be split open, maybe by elephants trampling them, and consume the innards, but the rind is, is much too bitter for them. When we see elephants, like in the National Zoo, consuming leftover pumpkins from Halloween, or the Jacksonville Zoo, or anywhere, it's because the bitter compounds, the cucurbitacins, have been bred out through domestication or greatly reduced. So this is non-bitter and you can eat this directly if you're a modern elephant. But these wild gourds, not so much. And in fact, for Paige Ladson and Lavis Simpson, while I find hundreds of seeds and occasionally the little stem, I find almost no rind. There's something like three rind fragments. So I assume and infer that these ancient elephants were adept at kind of popping open the fruits and, and slurping up the, the contents, the seeds and the and the flesh, but avoiding the bitter rind. The curvitations are present in the seeds and in the flesh, but, but not in the quantities typically is in the rind. So one other thing we did was in thinking about both mastodons and Paleo-Indians and, you know, elephants, how much can you consume of, of, of plants with these really super compounds? Um, we also then screened 45 mammal genomes for a bitter tasting ability, gene receptors that involve, you know, avoidance of bitter plant compounds. And we find 
that the highest um, numbers of bitter taste receptors were with small mammals like shrew and mice. And the lowest, interestingly, was an elephant relative, our Florida manatee. So that's kind of cool. So, so this allows, you know, again, coevolution, you know, mutualism and so on. It allows these small forms to not overdo, not do themselves in by consuming these bitter plant compounds. But generally the large mammals didn't too much have to worry about it. And this was Logan's calculations about a fully grown African elephant could consume, you know, so much and um, basically pass it through pretty quickly too. So they probably wouldn't have been harmed. You know, it did take a lot to have a lethal dose for a mastodon. So that was our main point about that. So then thinking about paleo Indians too, though, it's still quite bitter. And these are, are small, say, maybe golf ball to tennis ball, baseball sized fruits, typically, and hard shelled. The probably the main use was as a container. So you cut these open and you have a nice cup like form. And, and you know, this is well before the advent of pottery. So for mobile hunter gatherers, mobile foragers, paleo Indians and archaic people, something like this, you know, was probably pretty handy. They're lightweight, they're hard shelled, fairly durable. You just need to avoid the cucurbitaceans. It's possible that the seeds could have been used for seed oil um, or maybe a little bit consumed, but probably the original use was mainly in terms of the hard shell. And I'm not just guessing um, that, you know, from the genetics I just mentioned and so on, that people around Florida then were making use of this plant. It's based on the evidence all across the state where I have the impression that almost any time I enter into a wetland deposit, I'm going to see cucurbita evidence, seeds rind or both. So um, for example, and I'm bringing in the bottle gourd now, then too, Lagenaria. But the two, you know, Acilla River, Latvis Simpson, Page, Ladson, Cucurbita, and lots of mastodon remains. Little Salt Spring, which I'll get to in a minute, has both plants. Wendover has Lagenaria, the bottle gourd. Salt Springs, Ocala National Forest, both. Groves Orange Midden, um, both. That's in the uh, St. John's watershed. Anita Spring, apparently cucurbita. I didn't get to look at these before they were reburied. Perico Island, Harbor Isle Marina has uh, both. Hontoon Island, both. So spanning at least the late archaic through the St. John's cultural periods. Here's more from the Aqualaha. Uh, in South Florida, the Pineland and Key Marco sites, and now I need to add to this, um, Big Mound Key, um, or rather Mound Key have both. So it's all over the place and spanning a long stretch of time. And, and who knows what all is still being missed in this greater you know, region. So in other words, it's everywhere, and I think it's the association with humans that accounts for this widespread, over time and space, presence for this tax on this useful plant. All right, and so, too, to just back up a tad, um, so I've been mainly focused on the cucurbita gourds and the genus and species cucurbita pipo, subspecies ovifera, so our wild gourds. Two varieties are well known and fairly widely distributed in Eastern North America. And then the domesticated equivalents, ultimately the domesticated forms of this taxon include the ornamental gourds, scallop squashes and acorn squash. And these are thought to have been domesticated in Eastern North America based on the genetic and the archeological evidence and in, including Florida and maybe some of the earliest evidence in Florida. So that's another area that I'm headed to. The bottle gourd to flesh out a little more about that. 
no pun intended. So it's another hard-shelled fruit, it's really super thick rind in some cases and, and quite hard. And as, as the name suggests, it makes a great water bottle, you know, an ancient canteen and variously, you know, containers. So another container plant container function and well before the advent of pottery. So a sister genus, you know, with the same basic utility, the possibly, you know, consumption of, of seeds or seed oil. In this case, it's non-bitter as far as we know. But the really interesting thing is that these are from Africa. You might be aware of that. So it's like, what are these doing in the Americas at an early time frame? And there have been two hypotheses about their presence to explain their presence. One is that when Paleo-Indians moved from Northeast Asia, you know, either with boat traffic and or, you know, Beringia, Ice Free Corridor and on down into the lower 48 or all of the above, that they brought bottle gourd with them. So bottle gourd and dogs, like a plant and animal domesticate coming along with Paleo-Indians. The other idea is, is that bottle gourd would be um, readily available along the Florida coast and, and other circumtropical coasts um, as direct drift from Africa. So not people moving them in this case, but by oceanic drift from Africa um, and arriving in Brazil or the Caribbean or even directly in Florida. And there have been a lot of studies, st you know, plotting and, and tracking oceanic drift. And, and this was part of a study that our team did as well. Um, so those are the two hypotheses. And, and so the Florida sites help clarify that. <laughs> so I'll get to that in a second. So um, first, um, Salt Spring and Little Salt Springs. I noted those on the map a minute ago as two sites, um, mainly archaic, that have evidence for both taxa. So Here's our cucurbita gourd type seed and the rind, as you see it in thin section, archaeological. And here's bottle gourd seed and rind. Um, both morphologies are suggestive of wild forms. All right. So um, Salt Springs is, pre is in the Ocala National Forest. Recreation Center, you may be familiar with that. And I'm referring to work based on recent excavations by the Park Service, MPS, and the U.S. Forest Service. And the sum total of that work, which is part of redoing this wall, um, fringing the spring, was to show that this extended presence through the Archaic. So early Archaic, if not even late Paleo-Indian, through middle and late Archaic, and I have both gourd taxa throughout all those deposits throughout that time frame. Little Salt Spring was, you know, first kind of became famous because of Clausen's work on the 27 meter ledge here and to some extent too in the Spring Basin and even in the uh, Wetland Cemetery, Archaic Cemetery, so Paleo-Indian and Archaic presence. But in, um, in recent years, John Gifford and Steve Kosky um, out of the University of Miami have been revisiting the site and doing a lot of work both on the ledge, but especially the Spring Basin, which is my focus today. Um, plant materials from, from the basin. So um, it's kind of irresistible, but one thing that Clausen had noted was the presence of this broken rabbit stick or non-returning boomerang comparing it to Australian forms. And in recent you know, years, the new work, then um, Kosky and Gifford have recovered more of these. I think there's six total now. So I just think they're really neat, but it also alludes to the organic preservation presence. So here's another one while well, it was being plotted and recorded underwater. All right, and Clausen then was the first to report bottle gourd from Little Salt Spring. 
he indicated that this was a whole gourd when he recovered it. It's, it's shown broken here. The neck was intact and it just had a square hole cut out of the base of the neck, like to make it a bottle-like container. And then since then, variously working in the basin, um, Gifford and Koski have recovered more. So this, this is all represents one specimen among several that were recovered and, and now radiocarbon dated. This is their dates. Um, so bottle gourd. Here's another one shown in the recording in Little Salt Springs, so recording underwater. And um, this particular specimen then was analyzed by our cucurbitologist. Here's Logan again. And um, so we radiocarbon dated and then analyzed for the ancient DNA a series of archaeological bottle gourd samples, Lagenaria, from all over the place. So from Mexico, Arizona, various sites, Kentucky, uh, Peru, and Little Salt Spring, that specimen I just showed you. And so um, this is one of the earliest dates. It's the earliest in this entire assemblage. And the bottom line, as far as the genetics, is that it, it clearly, all this work clearly associated these gourd specimens with the African gourds, uh, direct out of Africa. So the oceanic hypothesis. I think personally that this doesn't preclude the other idea of gourds moving in too with Paleo-Indians. It's just in, in this data set, it clearly shows support for this African. So the direct drift, somebody's hanging out on the beach and goes, what is that? Oh my God, pick that up. That's a useful thing. And, and, and off we go. I'm being a little bit facetious, but but this directly implicated or supported the that idea. All right, and then so now I'm headed to Windover. So maybe near where you all are located outside of Titusville, and maybe you're well familiar with, with this site. It's a really exceptional uh, early archaic pond cemetery, and Glenn Dorn and Dave Dickel and colleagues did just a wonderful job with these excavations. And it's another site that I was grateful to be able to be part of. So um, here's a reconstruction based on the evidence for burials and, and how they occurred in this pond setting. And I could talk all day about this site and the basic paleoethnobotany, but we can note the framework of wood and the wrappings sh and shrouding the bodies. Ultimately, a fiber, like burlap-like blankets and maybe other textiles, including garments, were present. Here's some of the coarser blanket-like material. Um, it mainly looks like palm fiber to me, palm leaf fiber, but there could be more. But not to digress too much then, um, a bottle gourd was recovered with this burial, among other bottle gourd fragments um, associated variously with other burials, but this one was nearly whole, just the neck missing, just crushed. It was directly dated to around 7,000 years ago, so it's another early one. It was empty inside, um, except for a human incisor. And if I remember right, um, Dorn and Dickel said that it, it was from a child, so not necessarily, but maybe connected with this person, this young adult. So maybe like a gourd rattle um, or something, who knows. But anyway, here's another African bottle gourd and it's with this Wendover individual. So um, so there's one thing about, about these bottle gourds and I'm returning to this map is now if you look where I'm seeing both plants or strictly bottle gourd, and over time, there's too many bottle gourds to suggest that they're just all washing up, you know, on the Ormond Beach or something. And somebody goes, run and get that, you know, before it drifts back out. I, I think that certainly this was a continuous process, 
probably well into the Pleistocene, but that at some point in time, people were saving seed and, and carrying the seed along and probably planting it. Um, both of these plant taxa don't require a lot of care and management. They'll re-sprout from the seed, don't require a lot to go ahead and, you know, propagate. So I think that there's so much of it, though, to suggest that there's more than simply picking up the occasional bottle gourd, that bottle gourds as well as the cucurbita gourds, were being promoted by Paleo-Indian and Archaic people in Florida. All right, and then that brings me to Hontoon Island in Volusia County and Barbara Purdy's excellent excavations in the 1980s. So here's another one where both gourd taxa had been recovered. And um, this one provides an interesting um, record of size and shape variation in the cucurbita seeds, so just to focus on those, that suggests some in situ development, some domestication. Um, if anything, you know, quite incidentally, because of protecting and saving seed and, and this one's not so bitter. Why don't we save these seeds? Whatever. Um, so this is, I'm alluding to an early publication here where I cooperated with Dina Decker at the time um, with the University of Guelph. She's an expert in, in the cucurbitaceae, but especially um, cucurbita. So we, we teamed up and, um, and we did a, a numerical analysis of the seeds that I was starting to group by these different shapes, sizes and shapes. So I called this form type one. Type one is present in the orange period sample, so late archaic and spanning all the way through St. John's. It, it never disappears. But in St. John's two, so sort of late prehistoric, I was starting to note this larger form that I was calling type two. It has a different width to length ratio. They're rounder than the type one. I think you can see that and, and generally larger. And in our numerical analysis, we ended up associating the type one, no surprise, with the wild ovifera type gourds, but the, the type two form closely approximated scallop squash. So moving into things like scallop squash, maybe ornamental gourds. Um, and so also somewhat larger peduncles, that's the little stem. So um, what does that imply, you know, other than maybe the um, incidental because you've changed selective pressures and so on, if you're carrying around seed and sticking it in the ground and maybe protecting the plants, and maybe they were starting to notice differences in bitterness. And I start seeing more rind in association with these as well and somewhat thicker. So I'm saying that we're maybe looking at in situ domestication from a, a bitter container fruit to an edible rinded, you know, non-bitter fruit, something grown for the edible gourd squash, scallop-like squash versus this, although the original form is still grown, still continued. So looks like two things were happening in the St. John's II period, at least, at Hontoon Island. Even later at Hontoon Island, are two more types of cucurbita seed appeared. Um, more, still the same species, cucurbita pipo, but you can see these are much larger and some quite broad compared to the two prehistoric forms, the earlier forms. I, I think that these are tied to the, maybe the nearby mission, Mayaca, San Salvador de Mayaca, at any rate to stimuli associated with Spanish missionizing and the Spanish mission period. So I think these are introductions because of those outside forces. And in fact, those latter two are the a different subspecies, subspecies Peepo, and that is our, our pumpkins and things like 
crookneck squashes, zucchini. And this was domesticated in Oaxaca, in Mexico, um, thousands of years ago. And so, um, so with early Spanish contact in Florida and things going on too in around the Caribbean and Mexico, this appears to be a plant introduction sort of layered on top of what was going on with the indigenous cucurbita people subspecies ovifera. It's quite a story there. So, so the overall take is this directional change in seed size and shape seems to signal two things in C2 domestication of this type two form, but then the introduction of these additional forms, you know, in terms of Spanish contact. Also with these very large peduncle stems and a still thicker rind, you know, clearly edible pumpkin-like forms. In terms of Florida Native Americans and their practices, I still think that none of this suggests that at least the freshwater Tamuqua people of the St. John's Two culture and so on or Northeast Florida, I don't think this suggests reliance on agriculture and agricultural produce. I, I think this is still indicative of low level plant cultivation, abundant use of the abundance, you know, naturally present you know, in the St. John's greater watershed and variously, but with some casual cultivation and management of the, at least the gourd squashes and bottle gourd, maybe up around Jacksonville and so on in North Appalachia area for sure, corn and full-blown agriculture, but it's still almost non-existent in the St. John's, you know, in these areas. On Toon Island, I don't see corn until Spanish contact with those large pumpkins. So I think that we need to think in those terms, in terms of understanding it. So this kind of overall story, you know, is involved more or less all of these taxa, so the, the ancient wild cucurbita, quite bitter gourds, ultimately with human input over time, We've lost the megafauna, but humans are, are moving them and managing them. Apparently in C2 domestication, at least at Hontoon, maybe other areas, bottle gourd was present variously through all that time. It could have been coming by dr tropical drift for well into the Pleistocene, but in any event, obviously associated with human groups, at least as of the early archaic based on Windover. And then with Spanish contact, we have these other forms appearing. All right, and so that was, that's my last slide. I would say to this Gary Larson cartoon, not a carrot. <laughs> it was gourds of all types and, and I thank everyone. So, um,